Great. Thank you, Patricia. Hello, everyone. This is Esther Labrado. I'm an enrolled citizen of the North Fork Rancheria of Mono Indians and a descendant of the Morongo Band of Mission Indians. And I currently work as a project attorney at the National Congress of American Indians. Uh, NCAI is a technical assistance provider for tribes who are interested in exercising and currently exercising special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction under the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2013. Quite a mouthful. Um, but we uh, work with tribes and we work with the Intertribal Technical Assistance Working Group. And we're really pleased to be partnering today um, with the Department of Justice Tribal Access Program team in order to host this webinar and hopefully get as many of your questions answered as possible. So I want to thank all of you for joining today. And I want to give a special thanks to the National Council for hosting today's webinar as well. Um, and I'll give a quick overview, um, quick bios of our two presenters, and then we'll get to the content. So first we have Brad Colquitt. He's the Lead Business Relationship Manager for the Tribal Access Program at the Department of Justice. He's been a member of the TAP team since the beginning of the program in October of 2015. And he's responsible for oversight of the TAP Business Relationship Manager Systems and Trainer. He's also responsible for onboarding and vetting, deployment and training, and post-deployment support of TAP tribes. So Brad is really the go-to person um, for all things related to the Tribal Access Program. Prior to joining TAP, Brad worked in federal in information technology projects for numerous government agencies. And he has over 30 years of experiment of experience, excuse me, in IT consulting, planning, and implementation for various branches of the US government. Uh, also on the line, we have Marsha Good. She's the senior counsel to the director at the Office of Tribal Justice at the Department of Justice. And she's also been a member of the TAP team since it started. And she actually helped develop the program beginning in 2014. And she currently helps to administer, administer the program. So she's also a great person to reach out to with any questions. Prior to joining the Office of Tribal Justice in 2013, Marsha was an assistant United States attorney in the District of Montana. She prosecuted Indian country crimes, and she also served as the district's project-based childhood coordinator and prosecuted child exploitation cases for 14 years. She's also served as the deputy county attorney for seven years, prosecuting child abuse and neglect cases, juvenile matters, elder abuse, and felony cases. And she also worked as a district court judicial clerk in Montana. Uh, at the Office of Tribal Justice, she specializes in projects and policies in Indian country in the areas of criminal jurisdiction and prosecution, victim issues, training for law enforcement, sex offender registration, tribal access to criminal databases, and children's issues. So with that, I want to thank both Brad and Marsha for joining us today, um, and to all of the team for the Tribal Access Program. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Brad. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, my name is Brad Colquitt, and I'm the lead BRM for the uh, Tribal Access Program. Uh, my responsibility is uh, for managing and helping tribes prepare for deployment um, and uh, uh, other support activities um, such as that. Um, I'd like we're, today we're going to be talking about um, how the Tribal Access Program for National Crime Information, also known as the TAP program, has been supporting the public safety mission of tribes around the country by providing access to national crime information. And as uh, our objectives today, we're going to go ahead and do an overview of the Tribal Access Program as a whole. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background and context of uh, all of the capabilities of TAP. Uh, we'll then specifically uh, talk about um, how TAP is keeping uh, tribal communities and victims of crime safe. And finally, how tribes may apply to be part of TAP um, for fiscal year F uh, FY20. So, Taking a step backwards, just for context, uh, I want to talk about why a program like TAP exists in the first place. You know, why do we even need such a program? Well, federal law, both the Violence Against Women Act of 2005 and the Tribal Law and Order Act of 2010, provide authorization for tribal law enforcement agencies to access national crime information databases. And as a matter of fact, the uh, Tribal Law, law and Order Act 
specifies that the Attorney General shall ensure that tribal law enforcement officials that meet applicable state and federal requirements be permitted to access national crime information. So tribes have had this right to access this information now for going on 15 years. But the challenge is, uh, is that the reality of tribal participation in national criminal justice information sharing, it very much depends on the state regulations, state statutes, and state policies in which tribal lands are located. Um, and we have realized that tribes face barriers to accessing this information or entering information into various national crime databases when they're accessing it through the state. And we, we've seen this kind of along a, um, a spectrum. We have some, tri uh, some states like California that are public law 280 states that, that don't recognize tribal law enforcement as valid law enforcement and provide no access to criminal justice information. So in those states, a tribal law enforcement officer could pull over somebody on tribal land for uh, a speeding ticket or a broken taillight and not be able to, to find out information about that person, not find out that that person may be, for example, uh, have an active warrant for a serious crime. And we've got a police officer who has this person stopped, um, one, it's a missed opportunity to capture this person, and two, it's a safety issue for the officer who doesn't know that the person that he's dealing with may be a dangerous person. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, we have um, states who will allow tribes to access information. Sometimes it's limited that they will allow tribes to view information but not to enter the information. So we do have several states where a tribe can look at uh, warrants, they can look at criminal information, but they can't enter their own protection orders, for example, or enter their own warrants. If they want to do that, they have to actually go to the state and have a local sheriff enter that information on the tribe's behalf. And that really does not meet the um, uh, imperative of tribal sovereignty uh, when a tribe has to ask, Mother May I, uh, to the local sheriff's office to uh, have them enter a warrant or a protection order. In those cases also, usually those are not even attributable to the tribe, they're attributable to the county. Um, and then we have tribes that are, fall in between those ends of the spectrum. And so that's why the program uh, came into existence, was so that tribes would have parity with the states, that they are not dependent of the states and they shouldn't have to go through the states to access this information. Once again, it's been legally authorized now for almost 15 years and so the TAP program is providing access to national crime information through, uh, that's, that's uh, primarily owned by states and the FBI but providing direct access to that information. So. The program uh, as it exists today was launched officially in August of 2015 at the DOJ CGIS Tribal Day. Um, it is managed by the DOJ Chief Information Officer in, in conjunction with the Office of Tribal Justice, and that's who uh, Marsha is the uh, Chief uh, Legal Counsel for. Uh, but in reality, it's also been a partnership between the CIO and Office of Tribal Justice with several other uh, DOJ components, including the SMART Office, which is the Sex Offender Monitoring Office, uh, COPS, the Community Oriented Policing Service, OVC, the Office of Victims of Crime, FBI CGIS, which is the Criminal Justice Information Systems Division of CGIS, and they're the division that manages all of this criminal justice information and is responsible for um, disseminating this information to states and to tribes. Uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs and input from the tribes themselves. And this is an issue that DOJ um, has heard from tribes about for you know, well over uh, 15 years, even before the Tribal Law and Order Act and uh, VAWA Act were passed, was the fact that they did not have access to these systems. 
And when the VAWA Act uh, came about and the Adam Walsh Act for sex offender registration was legislated, it, it, it made mandatory that tribes register sex offenders, but tribes didn't have access to register those sex offenders. So that was also a large push. The program itself consists of three elements, somewhat like the three legs of a stool. The first one is invisible, but in my opinion, it's probably the, the, the most important. And that is, is that DOJ is serving as the access point for federally recognized tribes. In order to get to, to uh, FBI information, you have to go through, uh, for a better, lack of a better word, what I would call a sponsor. And that sponsor is called a CEGIS Systems Agency. Uh, every state has one. The District of Columbia has one. Um, and, and U.S. territories have one. Usually it's the state police who acts as the CEGIS Systems Agency. And they control access to FBI information. And prior to TAP, state uh, tribes had to go through the state CSA to get access to that FBI information. And as we, as we found out, they often ran into some barriers. With DOJ acting as the CSA, and we are already the CSA for many federal agencies, such as the FBI, Bureau of Prisons, uh, ATF, uh, DEA, et cetera, the DOJ res uh, re assumes responsibility for granting network access, uh, providing training, um, physical IT security, onboarding and vetting, which means making sure that the agencies provide the proper um, documentation to get authorized to access this information. So that's one part of the program. The second part is the technology. Uh, we provide two solutions. Uh, we call them tap light and tap full, and I'll explain those in a moment. But we provide the hardware and software uh, necessary to do a variety of functions, both for law enforcement, uh, criminal justice agencies such as courts and probation, uh, as well as non-criminal justice agencies such as uh, human resources and social services. And then the third piece is providing training. And the DOJ provides enhanced training and assistance, uh, advisory um, capability. We uh, provide online training as well as a week of on-site training. And we help tribes analyze their needs depending on the number of agencies that are participating, uh, who needs to take fingerprints, who needs to do name-based transactions, where the best place to put the kiosk is, and uh, things like that. And then we provide post-deployment uh, post support uh, through uh, 800 numbers, manned 24-7, so if the users have any issues, uh, there is somebody that they can call to get uh, help with those issues. So the TAP workstation itself um, consists of a ruggedized kiosk, and this is uh, for the TAP full. Kiosk itself weighs about 260 pounds and is ruggedized, uh, so it's, it's uh, appropriate for a detention style environment or, or an environment where people might be a little rough. The computer is locked in the uh, cabinet below along with the power supply that would keep things running for about 15 minutes in the event that uh, power was lost. The live print uh, scanner in the middle there uh, is for taking uh, electronic fingerprints and palm prints. It is bolted down to the kiosk. It cannot be easily knocked over. Um, the keyboard is a slide-out keyboard, so it can be um, hidden uh, while taking fingerprints and palm prints. Um, palm prints are required by sex offender uh, registration. Uh, it also contains a camera that you see next to the um, display, and that camera is for taking mug shots, as well as pictures of scars, marks, and tattoos. There are three pieces of software on the, on the computer. Uh, it makes things pretty simple. We have um, one piece of software called MESA, and that is a biometric uh, software. And it is used for capturing fingerprints, palm prints, um, mug shots, and scars, marks, and tattoos. And it's used in five different scenarios. Uh, it's used for uh, police doing arrest bookings or identifying persons who refuse to identify themselves. 
uh, law enforcement can take their fingerprints and submit them. And if they've ever been arrested before, uh, they will show up in the system. Uh, it can also be used for sex offender registration, which involves taking sex offender fingerprints and palm prints and uh, entering those p folks into the National Sex Offender Registry. It can be used for civil purposes, such as uh, human resources departments who are uh, um, doing background checks for any employees that have contact or control over Indian children, as well as for uh, social services uh, who are fingerprinting for foster parents or relative care or any kind of child placement. The second piece of software is something called OpenFox Messenger, and it is all about name-based checks, and it provides uh, access to a number of different systems there. I'm just going to describe a couple of them. Uh, NCIC is one of the major ones. It's the National Crime Information Center, and that is a database on persons and properties. So you would find in NCIC protection orders, um, uh, information on warrants, missing persons, missing children, uh, things like that, as well as stolen property. Triple uh, I is a, a national database of criminal histories, or rap sheets. So that's where we would uh, get a person's criminal history from. Uh, NLATS provides access to state level database. Uh, this is one uh, set of information. Um, services that is not owned by the FBI. This is actually owned by various states. And from that, um, we can um, access driver's license information, vehicle registration information, uh, state criminal history base databases. Uh, we can look at Canadian criminal histories. There's some Mexican uh, information, uh, as well as even checking uh, border crossings, uh, enter the license plate of a car, and we would, we would know any time that car crossed uh, the Canadian or Mexican border. So good for law enforcement. And LEAP down there at the bottom is, is used for it's the Law Enforcement Enterprise Portal, and it's used for um, sending transactions between MESA and NGI and getting the criminal histories back. It's a secure encrypted email. Um, and I will mention the rest of these later, but uh, those are, it's well over a, a, a half a dozen criminal information databases that can be accessed uh, through the TAP program. Um, in addition to the TAP full, which you see on the right here, we also offer a version called uh, TAP Lite. Um, it differs from TAP Full in that TAP Lite, we only provide OpenFox Messenger software, so we don't provide the kiosk and the live scan device. Um, so really, the only thing that can't be done using TAP Lite are fingerprint-based transactions. So we can't do arrest bookings or take folks' fingerprints for jobs or for uh, social services for foster care or for relative placement. Otherwise, all of the other systems that are accessed by TAP Full can be accessed through TAP Lite. It's only the fingerprints that are uh, missing. Uh, Cheryl's asking a question there real quick, and I don't want to ignore it, because can we use cross-match systems to run prints for pre-employment background checks? The TAP system, as it's configured now, is, is pre-configured as a um, turnkey system, meaning that it comes with everything it needs. It's, it's uh, down to even the users being uh, added to it. Um, so at this point, we don't have the capability to add additional or different peripherals to the machine. Uh, it would involve uh, creating interfaces for these new um, new devices, but it does come uh, with a scanner for each of the, the kiosks. And the cost to the tribes is free. There is uh, no cost to that. Um, okay, continuing on here, um, again, so we have about a quarter of our tribes right now are tap light tribes, and about 75% are tap full. So now we understand what the hardware looks like, we understand what software is on the computer, we can talk a little bit about what 
various agencies can do. When this program started, it was really directed towards law enforcement and especially to law enforcement um, uh, law enforcement agencies in Public Law 280 states. Uh, but as we expanded the TAP program from law enforcement, we began realizing there was a, a, a need for criminal justice access to criminal courts, prosecutor's office, pretrial services, corrections, and probation and parole. And so some of the things that these agencies can do are access investigative records from other DOJ components, other states, and other tribes. Um, that's through a system called NLETS, which has um, the uh, record information from over 6,000 um, jur jurisdictions around the country. So whereas NCIC or a criminal history might give you basic information like the person was arrested on April 1st, they were arrested on this charge, they went to court on April 15th and were convicted on uh, another charge, uh, NDEX would provide you access to the original police report, uh, witness reports, which might have information on uh, the, the vehicle that the suspect was driving, other people who are in the car with that person, the car's license plate number, uh, a lot of other information that might not be found in the basic criminal justice systems. Um, they also have access to a number of systems where they can enter information uh, about persons or property. And we'll talk about the specifics of those in just a moment. And for civil agencies, um, this really came about through um, uh, TAP. The initial pilots that we ran, as I said, were initially focused solely on law enforcement. And even states that have access to NCIC now, uh, that access is really only given to law enforcement. It's not given out to um, non-criminal justice agencies or civil agencies. So the agencies here that can take advantage are sex offender registry, uh, civil courts, public housing, child protective services, um, children's social services, or foster care, ICWA, relative placement, child support enforcement agencies, so uh, those agencies that are responsible for uh, ensuring that child uh, uh, child support payments uh, are being made properly, uh, as well as Head Start programs. And in, in a nutshell, basically, there's two types of things civil agencies can do. They can either take fingerprints for various record checks, uh, either for employment or for uh, child care, or they can run name-based checks um, in the case of uh, investigating child abuse or uh, other issues. But um, those are kind of uh, summary here of some of the things that, that these agencies can do. So at this point, at the end of FY19, we'll have uh, 72 tribes deployed, and that's both TAP light and TAP full, with over 300 agencies um, um, participating. When we originally began the TAP program, we, we were thinking we do, were going to do 10 tribes, and we thought, well, that's great. That's 10 tribes that we'll have to be responsible for, 10 tribes that we will have to onboard and vet and get documentation for. But as we got into it, we realized that uh, as far as the FBI is concerned, it's the specific agency that we need to worry about. So we realized each tribe had anywhere between four and nine different agencies that were participating. And so it, each agency uh, is really an entity in and of itself and has to be processed um, separately. We do ask for tribal coordination, but each agency um, gets onboarded and vetted separately. So let's talk a little bit now about how TAP can assist with uh, keeping communities safe and helping victims of crime. Um, there are a couple questions here, and it looks like uh, Marsha is answering, answering those. And if they're not answered by the end, we will jump in and, and take those. But it looks like Marsha's typing for you, Francis. So let's start with the ability for tribal police, uh, courts, 
um, to process tribal arrests. Um, so TAP provides the ability for tribes to provide and submit information into the national uh, criminal justice cycle so that that information is publicly available, not publicly available, but available to law enforcement nationwide. Um, so this could include arrest charges, uh, when the um, charge finally goes to court, what the final disposition is, so the court could enter the disposition. Uh, and if corrections uh, are involved, can involve corrections during the bookings as well. Tribes do have the right to decide what information they want to contribute to national uh, criminal justice databases. Uh, so we have some tribes that will do arrest bookings and will submit those to the FBI for serious crimes, assault, violent crimes, domestic violence crimes, but for lower level crimes, uh, you know, such as uh, you know, uh, drunk in public or uh, loitering, that those, those, those crimes stay within the community. They are not uh, exposed nationally. But it's the tribe's decision to do that. So criminal courts, in addition to being able to process dispositions, can also enter warrants, domestic violence protection orders, into national databases for off-reservation or awareness enforcement. Um, we have one tribe in Washington that was one of these uh, states that allowed tribes to look at information, but they couldn't enter. Uh, so they could not enter their protection orders uh, into the national system so that they could be available and enforceable off of tribal land. And within just several months of getting TAP, uh, they were able to enter. They had, I think, over 70 uh, protection orders that they were able to enter into the system so that they were available um, nationwide and enforceable nationwide. And then finally, pretrial services, being able to run criminal histories to make release determinations for judges to uh, make um, final sentencing decisions based on uh, whether this is a first offense or uh, a detent offense. Um, also, the ability for courts to be able to enter orders of protection and no contact orders. So civil courts uh, can enter, um, can run name-based checks uh, in conjunction with orders of protection um, in cases of domestic violence and stalking. Um, they cannot run name-based checks if it's uh, two neighbors fighting about a property line. But for domestic violence and stalking, uh, they can run a criminal history check on the, on the person uh, to find out if they have a history of domestic violence, um, you know, uh, how long should the protection order last, and things like that, or if any conditions should be added to the protection order, such as prohibiting uh, possession of firearms. Uh, prosecutors can enter charging documents, um, disposition, uh, information as well as domestic violence protection orders, uh, all of which are, are uh, actions that could prevent a person from purchasing a firearm. And that's done through the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, the NIC system. And that's something you might have heard on uh, recently in the news, that NICS is coming up. And NICS is the system that firearms dealers check to make sure that a person uh, is uh, eligible to uh, purchase uh, or possess a firearm, um, or purchase from a firearms dealer. Sex offender registration, the ability to enter uh, sex offenders into the National Sex Offender Register, um, where, uh, again, we take fingerprints, palm prints, photographs, uh, pictures of scars, marks, and tattoos. Uh, sex offenders have to register at least once a year. If they are a Tier 3 sex offender, they have to register every nine months, excuse me, every three months, so they have to register four times a year. If a sex offender does not show up for their regularly scheduled appointment and doesn't contact the compliance officer uh, within just a few days after the compliance officer has done his or her due diligence, the U.S. Marshal Service gets involved and a federal warrant is issued for this person. So. 
certainly the ability to, to track and monitor sex offenders is a very important uh, piece of the uh, tribal access program. Okay, so in terms of programs with access to children, uh, we have several agencies, and most of these are um, civil agencies or non-criminal justice agencies, where we can conduct records checks of employees who have access to children. And um, this is under, um, is uh, fairly broadly interpreted so that the tribal agencies such as social services, foster care, schools, daycare, school transportation, parks and recreation uh, can conduct fingerprint-based record checks on tribal employees, prospective employees, as well as volunteers who have regular contact or control over Indian children. So I say it's broadly interpreted in the sense that, um, you know, the, the volunteer who coaches the girls' softball team uh, is eligible to be fingerprinted under this program. Uh, you have doctors working at a uh, children's clinic would be eligible to be fingerprinted through TAP. So uh, any uh, agency whose employees or volunteers have regular contact or control with Indian children uh, can be fingerprinted through this process. And this includes for foster care, um, relative placement, and other children's placement services, as foster care licensing as well. Um, we have also a program uh, that's run through the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs called the Purpose Code X program. And what that is is uh, for emergency placement of children uh, under exigent circumstances. So a scenario might be it's uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, the police are called, um, uh, both parents are going to be taken away, one to the hospital and one to jail, and you've got a young child that needs a place to stay. And in that situation, prior to placing the child in a neighbor's home or a relative's home, uh, you would need to be able to, at minimum, do a name-based check to make sure that there's nobody in that household uh, who has uh, domestic violence history or violent crimes or is a sex offender. And through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, social workers can call a 1-800 number, provide the name and um, date of birth of the folks living in the house, and BIA will do a records check uh, for them. Um, states also have this program, uh, but of the 50 states, there's, there's only three states um, that allow tribes to use their Purpose Codex program. 47 of the 50 states will not let tribes go, you know, contact the state to get this information. So this is one where BIA had to step in and create its own Purpose Codex program because most of the states don't let tribes uh, participate. And Marsha, please scream if there's questions that, uh, that um, I can help with. OK, overall public safety, uh, some things that TAP provides is for ch uh, Child Protective Services, CPS. Uh, sometimes this is a separate division. Sometimes this falls under uh, Department of Family and Children's Services. But either way, um, uh, those agencies, CPS, uh, are authorized to run name-based checks of uh, suspects who are under investigation and in response to reports of child abuse, neglect, or exploitation. Um, so what they're looking for, what they can look for are does uh, the person who's accused, does this person have a protection order against them where they are not even allowed to be near the children to begin with? Um, are they registered in the violent person's file, uh, which is an NCA, NCIC file that indicates a person who has uh, assaulted a police officer or assaulted a civilian with a weapon? Uh, is the person a registered sex offender? Does the person have a criminal history that has a number of violent, uh, domestic violence charges on it. Um, so there's a lot of information that's uh, just a wealth of information for the child service uh, investigators who are investigating these and helping put together a case for the court. And then finally, public housing. 
um, is authorized to use TAP. And they actually have two methods. Um, uh, it's a two-step process. Uh, the first step is they can do a preliminary name-based check of uh, either an employee or an applicant, a housing applicant, or a tenant who's receiving housing assistance uh, to determine whether that person um, has a criminal history. Now, this check that's done by the police, they cannot tell uh, the housing department the details of that criminal history. They can only say, yes, there is a criminal history in the following states, or no, there's no evidence of criminal history. If there is evidence of criminal history, then housing is authorized to run a fingerprint-based background check. And the fingerprint-based background check, um, a person cannot lie about. So a person could apply for housing using a fake ID, use his brother's ID, but uh, he can't use his brother's fingerprints. And even twins have different fingerprints. And so that would pull up this person's criminal history if they do have a criminal background. So it's a way of keeping housing, uh, public housing uh, safe, uh, free of, uh, of folks that might have violent tendencies, sex offenders, and even folks who are residing in public housing for lease enforcement, um, uh, these checks can be run as well. So uh, in addition to those capabilities that uh, TAP provides that I, I think um, really do make a difference in communities in terms of having the information that allows these agencies and the staff members to do their jobs in keeping the community safe. Uh, TAP has also collaborated with a number of external agencies. So I mentioned one, which is the BIA um, Office of Justice Services Purpose Codex Program. So again, that allows us to do 24-hour name-based criminal history checks uh, to ensure that child, uh, children are being placed in uh, safe homes. We also have a partnership with NECMEC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Uh, NECMEC uh, attends uh, most of our TAP deployments and provides information uh, to law enforcement and social services about their capabilities. And the wonderful thing about NECMEC, it's the only, um, um, I guess, non-governmental agency that has access to NCIC. So when a tribe, a tribal police or tribal law enforcement enter a missing child into NCIC, it kicks off a bunch of processes on the back end. NECMEC gets notified. They have uh, experts and team members who will contact local tribal police, uh, offer assistance, anything ranging from literally making posters that they will take care of the whole poster. Uh, you know, there's a missing child. They will take care of getting posters out and helping get those posters created all the way through advanced things such as you know, um, age progression, uh, artists, um, uh, forensic scientists as well, if, uh, if it gets to that reach. And they have volunteer um, coordinators, team Adam coordinators that are, are regional um, who, again, work with tribal law enforcement and offer services. Tribal law enforcement is still, or FBI is still going to be in charge of these, but uh, neck neck is there to supply, uh, provide support. And along with neck neck, um, recently uh, there's a law called the Amber Alert in Indian Country Initiative, which provides funding and is developing programs to safely recover missing, endangered, exploited, or abducted children uh, through a coordinated efforts between tribes and uh, state and local governments. And so the Amber Alert is a a much more specific situation of a missing child. Uh, it needs to be uh, 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 high evidence of a kidnapping, that the child's endangered, and that will kick off, again, a string of events that would end up with uh, alerts being sent to people's phones. Uh, you've, you've seen these on the highway uh, and having those, those items activated. So our final slide is some, some success stories that we've had. 
uh, one, uh, this was our first year, we had a uh, prevented a person who had been convicted of domestic violence from purchasing a firearm after the police department identified uh, that he was an imminent threat to his former spouse. Uh, you know, he basically said he was going to kill her. And, um, and uh, they were able to uh, uh, enter information into the National Instant Criminal Background System that prevented him from purchasing a weapon. I mentioned our tribe in Washington State that had all their orders of protection entered into TAP so that they were available through national systems because that state required victims to actually literally take those uh, protection orders to the county sheriff and have, have the county sheriff enter them on the tribe's behalf, which is just, it's not a good use of time and it's not respecting uh, tribal sovereignty. Um, we were able to stop a known drug user with mental problems uh, who had been in, uh, found incompetent to stand trial from entering a per, uh, purchasing a for, uh, firearm. So that's one of the conditions that tribes can enter into the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, or NICS, uh, mental health issues, drug issues, and misdemeanor domestic violence convictions. Um, those are things that have to be entered manually. Uh, NICS automatically checks things like, uh, does the person have a felony conviction? Uh, but some of these others uh, have to be entered man manually, and um, certain drug abuse conditions uh, are, are qualified to prevent a person from purchasing a firearm. We had, uh, uh, in one of our tribes, the foster care program uh, conducted a fingerprint-based background check on a couple who was applying to be foster parents, and the prince re returned uh, a criminal history or an I identity history summary uh, with an extensive record on one of the applicants, including a manslaughter charge. Uh, the program was uh, alerted of this criminal history, and they ceased the licensing process for that family. And overall, um, TAP has improved tri tribal public safety by facilitating prompt um, criminal history checks for persons seeking positions in tribal law enforcement or any um, tribal criminal justice agency. So rather than sending out that application, uh, sending the fingerprints through the state and you know, maybe taking anywhere from four to six weeks to get the return, um, agencies are able to get responses on fingerprint checks in usually less than an hour. And this also works with foster care. One of our tribes, um, they do a lot of um, pre-checks for foster care licensing so that they have kind of a, a, a pool of foster care parents when ready. Um, and they had fallen way behind, and they said it, takes, it took about six weeks from the time they took the person's fingerprints till the time they got a response. And if the fingerprints were smudged in any way, they would get a letter back from the state or the FBI saying, you need to retake the fingerprints. And in this particular tribe, they had an extraordinarily large land mass, which meant maybe a person having to drive another four hours back to the uh, social service department to get re-fingerprinted. And once they got the TAP program, and the, one of the nice things about the electronic scanner is it does a quality check right away to make sure that the fingerprints are of sufficient quality that the FBI is going to characterize them. So um, the issue of smudges or things like that uh, are very, very low. And then on top of that, they get the responses back, whether there's a criminal history or not, Again, usually within an hour. I think the, uh, the official time is within 24 hours, but most of them come back with, within an hour or two. And for this woman, she said that was life-changing for them. She said to be able to, to turn that around from uh, a four- to six-week period to a two-hour period and have a high degree of confidence that um, uh, the fingerprints were correct was, uh, was a, a great improvement. So I uh, just want to talk a little bit for those who are interested in applying for TAP, um, how to do that. So uh, TAP is accepting applications now for FY20. 
uh, application period runs from September 1st through October 31st. Um, you can apply online at that URL, and there is an application. You will complete that, print it out, or excuse me, and then email it uh, to the email address uh, below. In terms of criteria, uh, there are three must-haves, or one of three must-haves, and that is that the tribe must have either a tribal sex offender registry pursuant to the Adam Walsh Act, and are unable to submit all their data to national systems, or uh, have a tribal law enforcement agency that's not a BIA direct service agency, and they will use TAP to enter to access NCIC and other national databases for both query and entry purposes, or um, use the TAP system in a, uh, to assist in providing services to victims of crime. Uh, one of the ways that this is done is through a commitment to enter orders of protection um, from the courts into the systems. Then the other things that we, we look for in the application are tribal government's willingness and commitment to participate in the program at a tribal level. Um, where we have found that TAP does not very, work very well is when one agency applies and nobody else in the tribe knows that that agency is applied, and then the tribe actually wins, and we come out and say, congratulations, here's all this great stuff you can do, and HR department has no idea what we're talking about, social services has no idea, courts don't have any idea what we're talking about, and so it's really important for uh, tribal government uh, to be a leader on this and be able to help uh, the tribe as a whole uh, complete the t activities that need to be done for a successful deployment. Uh, we're also looking for diversity of tribes in, t in terms of size and geographic location. So just because a tribe might be small, uh, it doesn't mean that um, you're counted out. And finally, it's the need for access. And our goal is to reach out to all tribes, uh, but the priority is really on tribes that have some sort of limitation to national crime information. Uh, tribes who are not able to get to NCIC, who are not able to uh, submit arrests and bookings to national systems uh, are the tribes that are going to get priority, even if they're a, a small tribe. So for more information, uh, you can visit the, um, the website there. Uh, if you do have any questions, you can contact the Tribal Access uh, email box with those questions. And at this point, I will open it up uh, to any questions that have not been answered uh, in the chat window, which has been very busy. Um, so, uh, Patricia, I'll kind of turn it over to you to um, perhaps manage uh, any questions that are coming in. or either Patricia or Esther or okay, Marcia. So I just want to go ahead and answer your question regarding the Q&A uh, chat transcript. Mm -hmm. um, so you, that can be made available if the organization would like to provide one. So I will get that all provided for you and send okay. that off over to the organization. So if you'd like to send that over to participants, we most certainly can do that. Okay, so we'll turn it over if anybody has any questions. Uh, we've got about 12 minutes left. and. Uh, hi, this is Esther. Um, yeah, and I think that uh, was kind of directed my way. So my chat function, unfortunately, isn't um, working, so I can't actually okay. see any of the questions. So I apologize. I, I can't facilitate that. Um, Marsha, are you? It seems like you're probably busy responding. Yeah, um, yeah Marsha's typing away. Um, I believe I've answered all the questions that are in the chat, but we're happy oh. to take any other questions. Um, somebody wants to keep typing in questions, we're happy to answer for as long yeah. as you have them. We just kind of want to make sure that we stress um, that this is a kind of a whole of tribal application. So the tribal administration needs to be on board with this. Um, and then there are you know, the agencies on slide seven and eight that are applicable um, and that can um, be in part of the TAP program. 
you know, if they are going to be, there's a part of the application that they sign off on so that everybody's on the same page. Um, and so there's that piece that you need to make certain of. It, it's not every agency that has to apply and, and um, use it, but at least uh, some of them do. Um, again, kind of to, to go over what Brad said before, there is no cost. Um, the Department of Justice uh, funds the entire program through the SMART office, the COPS office, and the Office for Victims of Crime. So basically the tribe just has to provide, you know, high-speed internet access, and it's a, a plug-and-play kind of thing. We come out, we do the training, we do the setup, um, all of that kind of stuff. So we don't want to interfere if the tribe has a good relationship with the state and their access to the state is working. So there are tribes that may not need us, but there are tribes that may have some access but not you know, access to be able to do everything they need to, you know, they want to be able to do. Like they can look at information, but they can't enter information. And so we want to be sure that, that we can, you know, have whoever needs that access be able to be in the program. And Marcia, can I just give an example uh, of one that we've, we've run into recently? Um, the state of Arizona it works fairly well with tribes in providing uh, NCIC access. Um, they can look at it. I, I believe most tribes can enter stolen property. What they can't do is they can't enter sex offenders into the National Sex Offender Registry. So in order to do that, they have to fill out a form and submit that to Arizona DPS, and Arizona will enter that on their behalf. The problem is, is that they never get a notification that it was entered or if it was entered, because if Arizona doesn't have an equivalent sex offense charge, Arizona will not register that sex offender. And so when we went to a recent tribe, of their 40 sex offenders, uh, it was there was 24 of them, excuse me, they had 66 offenders, 24 of them were not, were not entered into the National Sex Offender Registry because Arizona State didn't, they didn't have a corresponding charge, so they just didn't enter them. But they never notified the tribe, and the tribe had no way of checking. So, um, so even if the, the police do have access, and sometimes they will argue vehemently that they have everything they need. You know, we, we have full NCIC access, but when you dig a little bit, we find out sometimes that they really don't have everything. And in, in the sex offender case, that happened to, to be the case with a number of tribes. That it, the police did, did not use TAP. They continued using their state access for uh, you know, traffic and for criminal histories, but they were using it for TAP, I um, mean for SORNA. And one of the questions that we just answered on the chat window was kind of the time frame, and basically, you know, we are, the applications are open September and October. We'll decide in November um, how much, you know, the funding that we currently have, how many tribes we can um, add to the program. And then we'll start, we'll notify the tribes, and then we actually start working with them in January in terms of, you know, all the paperwork, the who's going to access, which agencies are going to access, doing the training that's required. There's some online training to do before we come out, figuring out where the kiosk is going to go, if it's tapped full, just all of those decisions that Brad as a um, business relationship manager works with the tribes on, and then we will start deploying kiosks. You know, it's kind of um, whoever's ready first is, is kind of where we go. Um, and so that will depend on how quickly your tribe can get through a number of things. Um, it could be, you know, as quick as four, four or five months, and, and it might be the entire year. It just kind of depends on, on how fast things go for you. And I'll also add to that in terms of how quickly uh, the various tasks can be done. Um, our, our base schedule is um, about three months from beginning to end if the a tribe was able to get every task done on time. You're looking at about a three months period, maybe three and a half months. What tends to make that successful is uh, the primary, having a strong primary point of contact who has some authority over the various agencies who are going to be participating 
and is able to uh, highly encourage them to get their tasks done on time. And then above the primary point of contact, having a tribal executive who is also monitoring the process of the, uh, the pre-deployment. And Marsha is the person when you know, things begin to start slowing down, she has a monthly report to the tribal executive to say, hey, you know, we need some help in getting this agency moving. They're you know, lagging behind. Um, but it's, it's good leadership can, um, even, even the largest tribes can get done incredibly fast um, with, with the strong leadership. So this is Marsha again. One of the big uses that we've had with the TAP system is um, basically volunteers or employees who have care, contact, or control over Indian children, and that would include foster parents, school teachers, um, relative placements, all of those kinds of things. There's a, a significant number of those checks that are done um, through TAP on, on a regular basis. And so if that is um, one of the issues that you're interested in doing, um, yes, you would apply for TAP full and uh, would be able to do the checks that way. This is Esther again. Um, either Marsha or Brad, would you um, be able to give just a couple comments in terms of the resources that are available? I know there's um, the general brochure, the application, and the worksheet. And I think the worksheet especially can be really useful. Um, I don't know if everyone's had a chance to download those materials yet, um, but if you want to give maybe an overview of just kind of what is included in there and, and what information it provides. Sure, I'll go ahead and answer that question, and Brad, I'll let you take the question that was typed in the chat um, box. Sure. So the, the brochure just kind of gives you a little bit of background, um, and that is one of the files that's attached. Um, the application, we tried to make it pretty darn simple to just say, do you have a police department? If so, do you want them to use? That kind of thing, and just walk through it. But then we realized that the, the worksheet was probably the best document for tribes to sit down and look at, because we are limited by federal law as to what um, can be done with the TAP kiosk in terms of background. So the worksheet, I think, is the most important document you can take a look at because it'll tell you, you know, these are the only things that you can use this kiosk for, uh, the TAP full and TAP light service for. Um, so do you have any of these? And if so, then you would be eligible to apply. And it kind of helps you narrow um, your thoughts about what the tribe, you know, currently does, which is sometimes, um, you know, very instructive to, to figure out what exactly your tribe is actually already doing, what access you already have versus um, what, what you might need. And so I think those are the, the really important resources. Um, we also, you know, have this tribal access email box. And so any questions that you either didn't get answered today or that you think of later, um, absolutely just zip us an email at that. It's um, manned basically all the time and we'll make sure that we get right back to you, especially since we've got an application period open and we want to encourage tribes to apply. Um, that's a, a really good way to kind of um, get a hold of us and, and ask any additional questions. The other kind of rumor I think that's been uh, floating around out there is that Public Law 280 tribes um, are not eligible for TAP, and that's absolutely not accurate. Tribes in Public Law 280 states um, are completely eligible for TAP um, if they have tribal law enforcement or if they have a sex offender registry or if they do something that might um, involve work with crime victims like a tribal court that issues orders of protection um, or uh, social service agencies that you know, work with children who've been abused or neglected, then you're absolutely eligible to apply. Great, thank you. Uh, and we are near the end of the hour. As I mentioned, unfortunately, I can't really see the progress on the chat. Um, I believe we're uh, available to stay and answer as many questions as possible, and um, even after the webinar is over, as both Marsha and Brad have mentioned, please feel free to reach out with additional questions. Um, you know, we want to make sure that uh, if you're interested in applying, that we can help in any way we can. Uh, so I'll give it a couple more minutes. Um, 
and like I said, I, I can't really see, <laughs> see the chat, so if someone else wants to kind of um, decide, I don't know if the, for the presenters, if you um, have other meetings and things you need to get to uh, now that we are at the end of the hour. I, I can stay um, and answer questions. Um, it's not a problem. Brad is answering questions right now. It looks like we have another one coming in um, from Willa, and we'll get that one answered as well. Yep. And then if anybody has any um, questions that you weren't able to ask, again, you can send those questions to the tribal access at usdoj.gov. One of the questions that we just got from Willa was that the tribe is in the beginning stages of developing law enforcement department. Do they need to wait to apply or can they apply now? They have a tribal court and social services. So if you have a tribal court that issues orders of protection um, or a child social services that would deal with abuse and neglect cases, you can apply now. You wouldn't be able to use it, your law enforcement agency wouldn't be able to use it until they're actually up and running um, and you know, complete kind of the requirements and the steps that FBIC just has to qualify as a law enforcement agency. But you certainly can um, use it for the other, um, the other purposes. Looks like we have one more question coming in. And just from the TAP team, we wanted to say a big thank you to NCAI for hosting this webinar so that we can get as much information out to tribes who are interested and answer people's questions because it's, this will be actually our fifth year um, of TAP. It's kind of hard to believe from when we started. Um, but there are still you know, a lot of tribes that have questions or um, you know, kind of concerns about what the program is or how it can be used or what it can be used for. So we're really grateful to NCAI for putting this together um, for our tribes. Thank you. And I'll actually um, give the thanks right back. Thank you both for taking the time uh, to join us today. And I think it's been uh, really useful. So thank you. OK, I'm just taking a look at Casey's question here. Um, so um, most dr uh, driving violations would not show up on a fingerprint-based check. Um, and uh, human resources, unfortunately, does not, is not authorized to use, uh, to go directly into state um, databases to look up that information. Um, and, and let me um, kind of add on to that piece. That's not a TAP um, issue or a TAP barrier. That's a federal law barrier because the TAP program operates under federal law. So we have to go by what Congress says, you know, access can be granted for. Um, the Department of Justice, you know, has issued um, several statements indicating great support for legislation that would include tribes in um, kind of the overall uh, things that all federal and state um, agencies could do. Um, that legislation has not yet passed, but we're hopeful that that, that will occur. Um, and that would allow, if that passes, then that would allow tribes to do a lot more of these kinds of individual things that they're interested in. Um, like, you know, if somebody's running for counsel and, and your tribe has a, res has a requirement that they have a background check, you know, then that could happen. But right now, those things are not available. We're limited under federal law. So we're going to, you know, kind of continue to, to push for that. But I think Casey's question is, um, you, know, uh, it, you know, that would be a general record check because you're, you know, doing a, a check for somebody in a, a position that doesn't, isn't covered by the law. I think there are no other pending questions on the, the chat thread. Great. Well, thank you again, and thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, as was mentioned, please feel free to send additional questions uh, to tribalaccess at usdoj.gov. Um, and a special thank you again to the National Council um, for getting the webinar all set up. Thank you.
Thanks. Have a good day.